uh, actually, hold up, I got ahead of myself. Hold up, we'll hold on that. All right, I need, I need uh, real quick, I need all the um, girls to be over here, all the guys over here, real fast. You'll be able to move back to your seat later, real fast. And I need one, one girl volunteer right now, one girl volunteer. Come on, Mackenzie. Stand right here. Actually, right here is fine. All right, now here's what we're going to do. We're going to play, we're going to play backward charades. Now, y'all stand up, girls. What's going to happen is, what's going to happen is a word is going to come up on the screen. You've got to make sure and look that way. It won't be on the back. A word's going to come up on the screen. You've got to act out so she can guess what the word is. Now, the other rules, you, you can't look at the screen. There can be no sound effects. No pointing out or drawing of any letters or words, and you may use props that happen to be in the room. All right, everybody understand that? Now, the first one is easy, and the second one is hard, so we'll see how you do, all right? So here we go. Go ahead and put up the first one. It's, three, three, it's a three-word phrase. There you go. All right. All right, now that one was fairly simple. All right, let's try the hard one. Go ahead with the next one. No, no, go back. The second one. Number, the second one from the top. Hold on a minute. All right, this is it. This is it. Three word phrase. There you go. All right, she got both of them. All right, guys, I need a volunteer. Come on up. Uh, come on up, Cal. All right. All right, guys, y'all stand up. This is your turn. Okay. Bring up the first one. All right, that was quick. All right, now here's, this might be the hard one they just got, but we'll see. Go ahead. Can't make sound effects. Hey, no. Three word. There you go. Good job. All right, girls. Girls, we need a volunteer. Uh, come on, Bria. All right. Come right here. Girls, stand up. All right. So the first one is the easy one. All right, go ahead, Luke. Praying. All right, that was easy. All right, the second one, the harder one. This is a four-word phrase. Driving a race car? Driving a racing car? Oh, driving for a race. <laughs> Got uh, 10 seconds. Driving a small race car. Oh, driving a, um, I know what it is, but I can't remember. Driving a remote car. 
All right, that was close. It was driving a go-kart. You had all different ones. All right, let's get a high school boy. High school boy. Okay, so here comes the easy one. Boy, stand up. Okay. Brushing my teeth. Flossing. We'll give it to him. He said brushing my teeth. Okay, that's it. All right. Now let's go with the hard one. Making soup. Oh, frying. Cooking. Cooking with a pan. Cooking with a wok. Uh, cooking. Frying. A pan. A, a fryer. A spade. A wok. Oh, flipping a pan. Flipping a flipping a flipping a, a frying pan. Oh, pancakes, making pancakes, frying pancakes, cooking pancakes. So uh, close. Using your watch? <laughs> cooking pork. <laughs> cooking, cooking beef, cooking fried chicken. Good try, good try. All right, one more girl. Oh, you, you already went. Come on, Chloe. Go ahead, Chloe. All right, Emily, come on. Okay. So, girls, stand up. So, so far, Mackenzie got both and Cal got both, right? All right, here we go. Here's the easy one. Yawning. All right, good, good. All right, now here's the harder one. Fixing my hair? <laughs> Putting on a wig? All right, good job. All right, good job, everybody. Cat, uh, Colin, come on up. some more scripture tonight and tonight I'm going to read Psalms 143 8 through 10 so those verses say let me hear your loving kindness in the morning for I trust in you teach me the way in which I should walk for to you I lift up my soul deliver me O Lord from my enemies I take refuge in you teach me to do your will for you are my God let your good spirit lead me on level ground um and I was going to say more, you know, in each verse, but kind of we got cut off on time a little bit. So I'm going to just tell you, like, kind of the application. So I just put, as you experience God more and more of God's grace and love, let that change you more and more. Don't be afraid or give up. Push through and only follow God. You will make a difference. You could stand and worship with us tonight.
faces are yesterday. All your promises are yesterday. Songs to rise to you. When 
temptation comes my way When I cannot stand I'll fall on you Hope and stay And when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay You are my one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh God, how I Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound. And drenched in tears, they lay him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Forevermore, 
guys would pray with me real quick. Dear Lord, I uh, just thank you for this amazing day where you've allowed us to gather, Lord, in this uh, church, Lord. But we know the church isn't the building, God. It's the people inside the building and the followers who follow you, Lord. And I just thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for just uh, what all of us can be for you, what all of us can do for you when we uh, work together and when we are with one another, Lord. And I just pray that you, we would uh, work together to listen to Cameron tonight and just, um, Lord, apply what he teaches us to our lives, Lord, and become better for you. In your name we pray. Does this work? Okay, we're good with this one. All right, good evening. Go ahead and turn to Galatians, the book of Galatians. We're in the New Testament tonight, and as you're turning there, uh, I just want to kind of go back and reiterate something that uh, Robert was sharing earlier, which is, um, hey, I want to encourage you. Uh, you only get a certain amount of years uh, within the youth ministry. I came here uh, in the summer uh, after my ninth grade year, and so I only had a limited experience uh, in youth group, um, but these are formative years for you. You're going to have a lot of fun together, you're going to have a lot, of, a lot of fellowship, but I have lasting friendships that are still here to this day. Uh, these were years in which uh, I learned more about Christ, I was saved, I grew in my faith, and so if I can encourage you, man, take every opportunity you get in this room and with this group, no matter if it's in here, no matter if it's at Caswell, no matter if it's at Hendersonville, Matter if it's an event such as Elevate, take every opportunity you can because one day you'll look back on it and wish you could go back to them. One day uh, you'll be on the wall outside uh, and you'll be years down the road and you'll be thinking back like, man, those years were awesome and they were really big for my life. And so uh, with that, uh, tonight, uh, one of the things that is awesome and one of the things that we're kind of here for is Christ. And tonight uh, we... I came to Robert uh, this week and told him what passage we were going to be studying together, and uh, it's kind of funny because it lands on where your quiet time was, and that was not planned. So I think that's really cool, uh, and so we're going to dive in that together, um, and so with that, we're going to look at Galatians 1, uh, verses 6 through 10, all right? So let's go ahead and look there. We're going to cover all the chapter essentially, but that's going to be our landing spot for most of our study, okay? So Galatians 1. Verse 6, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before now, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. And so with that, uh, hey, we always like to have a main idea, a focal point uh, for our entire study together, and it is this. Cling to the gospel that is true, trustworthy, and transforming. Cling to the gospel that is true, trustworthy, and transforming. I'm going to tell you, uh, many of you are already experiencing this in your schools now, but especially when you get to college, you're going to experience what this looks like in this passage of hearing gospel that is contrary to the one that you have received, or the one that you know of. You're going to hear of people who are going to try to sway you, distort things, or keep you from seeing uh, who the one true God is, to seeing what the one true gospel is. They're going to try to provide influence, and that is at a point for us in which we have to stand firm. And so that's why tonight I encourage us to cling to the gospel that we know is true, cling to the one we know is trustworthy, and cling to the one that we know is transforming. And so our three points tonight that's going to guide our time together is no other God, no other glory, and no other good. No other God, no other good, 
excuse me, no other glory and no other good. All right. So let's first jump in together. We see uh, we're in the book of Galatians. And so Paul is speaking to the Galatian church. If you're familiar with uh, Paul, how many letters does he have? Which is, is kind of fun, but how many letters does he have? Three. Okay, we have three. What else we have? Okay, there's where the fun comes in. All right, so we have a 14 up here. I didn't know if somebody was going to say 13. So Paul is speaking to the Galatian church, and this is what we would say is potentially the first letter. All right, so chronologically, A.D. 48, 49, and that's a long time ago, but first letter, Okay. Typically what happens is these letters kind of go with an introduction and then they go into a thanksgiving. A passage that kind of reveals how thankful he is to the church, how thankful he is to God, those things like that. And instead, what do you see here? It's like introduction and it's like, boom, I'm going straight to the point. Like, there's no thanksgiving. And so some people are like, well, maybe that was the first letter, maybe they le- maybe learned from that and kind of wrote different other letters. No, I think Paul here is speaking specifically to the Galatian people for a reason in this context. I think it's very important of why he's sharing like this. Paul is combating false teaching. Paul is combating the fact that people are presenting a different gospel. And so he comes with a, with lack of better words, a ferocity that says, hey, I'm going to speak to you and address the fact that here's why I'm astonished. Here's why I'm astonished. So tonight we're going to learn some Greek words as we go through. Uh, you can have fun with that if you want to, or you can just kind of, you know, dodge and just remember what we actually say about them. Uh, but... We're going to learn about why he's astonished and why there are these no others, so to speak. So, verse 6 says this, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. All right, astonished. Say this with me, thalmazo. Thalmazo. Okay, let's do a little bit better than this. Okay, I'll say it one more time and then maybe you can repeat it back. Thalmazo. Thalmazo. Okay, good job. That's a little bit better. All right. This is the word in Greek for astonished, okay? And here's what it means. It means to marvel, to wonder, or to be standing silent in amazement, okay? There are many things that you maybe uh, think about this, okay? For example, for me, uh, I remember I was in my friend's basement last year, uh, about a few weeks ago last year, and here's one thing that was so glorious that it happened was this, the Braves won the World Series. You can resonate with this, right? I mean, it's just a moment which I was kind of in amazement because I've never seen this before, uh, and I was just amazed. But really, for me, two moments in my life were, to, for me, the heart of this, of the word astonished. Seeing my wife walk down the aisle and seeing my son born. So far in my life, those are the two moments that I would say, man, fit this. It's almost that, that beauty of uh, and one day you're going to, Lord willing, get to experience that. But you're going to look and you're going to see either the groom or the bride or your significant other. You're going to see them, your fiance. You're going to see them come down and you're going to be blood to them in a moment. But that moment, that stillness, there's just something beautiful about it. And then when my son was born, I mean, it's just, it's just something so beautiful. And you just stand there and you marvel in amazement. So those are good things. Those are good ways in which we stand and marvel at we are amazed at. And so if you take that same word and take that same kind of uh, posture, attitude, now let's make it pretty negative, okay? That's exactly what he's saying here. I'm astonished. I'm standing in amazement. I'm silent. I am, in some ways, shocked because why? You have so quickly deserted him. You have so quickly deserted him. This word for desert is literally, deserting is literally mean to bring to another place. It's the same word that's used in scripture when Enoch uh, is translated from earth to heaven. It's the same word. And so in this, this is what it means. It means to uh, literally to translate, to bring to another place. It's often used to uh, where you have allegiances and you've kind of disowned that allegiance or you're simply this, a traitor. And you're familiar with those words. And Paul is basically saying this. He's showing them that, hey, you are a traitor in this. You have betrayed. You have left. You are fleeting. Essentially deserted. Now, there's a couple of important things here. One, the Galatian church, these people that are right here, have just came off of a big moment in which 
uh, the gospel was being shared. People were coming to saving faith in Christ. People were reaching others. They were loving each other. They were serving each other. And then just like that, just like that, Paul is now having to speak back to them and say, how, how quickly you have deserted me. How quickly. And so let me, go ahead and, let me go ahead and share something to you really, really, really quickly. Is this, when you see a movement of God, you need to go ahead and know that Satan is going to be present too. He's going to be present. Why? Because he wants to wreak havoc on anything that God's doing. He wants to distract you. He wants to prevent you. He wants to move you into a place that has no focus, no awe, no wonder of God. And simply put, these people have just came off that. And, it, and in some ways, this is where we get encouraged, especially coming off things such as camp, such as different things that you've had, like big uh, D now, things like that. It's like you get such a spiritual high. You get such a, hey, I've loved this. And now it's time for discipleship to continue to take form day to day. And these people have left. They've, they've wondered. They've deserted. And he's very clear. They went to a different gospel. But he says this. There's not another one. Not that there is another one. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel. So he's very clear on two things. One. There's not another one. And two, there are people that are going to want to sway you. There's people that are going to be against you. There's people that are going to want to try and distort. They're going to trouble you. This is something to keep in mind for us. And here's why. It is extremely important the people you surround yourselves with. It is extremely important of who you surround yourself with. It's extremely important who you listen to. Who do you spend, go ahead and think about this for a second, who do you spend the most time with? And this is an interesting question. Uh, just to give you an idea, back when y'all saw the pictures of me, I know I looked a whole lot different, but like when you saw those pictures of me, here's some interesting things. Uh, one, um, iPhones weren't really a, a thing, okay? So that wasn't a thing. All right, it was not a thing either to be able to go anywhere in the world uh, and be able to uh, access apps or social media or the internet. That wasn't a thing. You lived in your youth years in a different world than even I lived in. And why am I bringing this up is because sometimes your most interactions are not even with people that are actually around you. Sometimes your most interactions are things that you hear or see or partake in on social media, on the internet. And so when you ask yourself, what do you, what do you surround yourself with, and you answer it with some of those things, what do those things do to you? What are they saying to you? What are they revealing? Those are all important. And we'll continue on that in a second. But it says this, and it, this, is a, this is also important for us. Be, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Now, I'm going to be, be honest with you. I, the same word for astonished, I would be astonished if an angel preached a gospel contrary uh, to the one we know. Okay? That's pretty it would be pretty crazy, pretty wild. But the point here that he's making is this, that even if this is the case, believe in the gospel because it is true. It is very important for us. We should, every sermon we hear, every message that's preached in here, every message that's on Sunday, every message that you hear in your entire life, every devotion, you should go back to the lens of Scripture and, and let that be your God as well. That's your main God. Let that speak. People can have eloquent speech. They can sound good. They can sound nice. I almost call this a TikTok theology. I don't like TikTok. I don't have TikTok, so don't ask me about TikTok, okay? But I can tell you this. I've seen so many little snippet videos that sound so wonderful to so many, and yet they're so, so wrong. The theology can be so terrible. But it sounds nice. It looks nice. It came across well. But I'm just to be honest with you. A lot of times we... We place ourselves, and we, we listen to those things far too often when in reality it should be God's word that we are listening to, God's word we're spending time with, God's word that we are digesting. As we have said this before, now I'll say again, if anyone's preaching to you gospel, he's basically saying the same thing again, but then he gets to a point in which uh, it's very important for us, am I now seeking approval of man or of God? If I could encourage you, 
I mean, I'm not encouraging you to do this, but if you could, like, tattoo something on your forehead that you see every single day, which can be kind of funny, you know? But if you could do that, maybe just, maybe just roll on a sticky note, but uh, ask that. Every decision you make, every friendship you have, every place you go, everything that you do, put it under the lens of this question. Am I now seeking, am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? And then the second question, or am I trying to please man? Because then he follows this up with something important. And he basically says this, you cannot be a servant of Christ and please man. There is no potential for that. There is no place for that. You cannot, in the same breath, be a servant of Christ and please man. You can't. And so as, as we dive into this real quickly, I know I got short time, so I'm going to I'm going to go quick. Y'all know I can be long-winded. So, our three points. The first one was this, no other God. No other God. That is, that's really the focal of the passage, no other gospel, but I wanted to bring up three aspects of that gospel. So, another God. And I'm going I'm to ask you, this is a rhetorical question, so don't answer this out loud, but ask yourself this, who is God? Who is God? And when you think about that, I just wrote down a few things uh, in scripture, uh, or that we see of attributes of God, he's creator, he's author, he's holy, he's perfect, he's Lord, he's provider, he's ruler, he's sustainer, he's healer, he's redeemer. Now we could continue this list on and on and on, but these are just some that I quickly came up with, but that is, that is who God is. But who is God to you? Who is God? And here's one thing I want to make mention of. How have you seen God move in your life? So take that, who is God, and as you answer that, how have you seen him move in your life? The last few weeks for Rocco and I have been really uh, interesting. Uh, my dad had a leg bypass, he had 100% blockage in his leg, which led to, then he also had to have an amputation across his foot, and then uh, he had a heart attack at the hospital, and he's continuing to rehab right now. In the midst of all that, we had to take Judah to the ER, uh, our first ER visit, he ended up with bronchiolitis, RSV, uh, and so we've had just a difficult, this has been a difficult season for us. Uh, we've had a lot going on, and uh, I'm going to be honest with you, uh, what I've seen in the midst of all of that is answering the question of who is God. I have seen that question answered so many times. For example, I literally walked into the room when my dad was having a heart attack. We didn't know it was at the time. But I literally walked into the room at the, same, at, the, at the time that he was having it. We've had people, I remember uh, his most discouraged day when he was needing just an uplifting. Uh, I was sitting there, I couldn't go that night, and I was just like, sit, I, honestly, I was praying on my ride home, like, Lord, can you send somebody to go visit him? And there's a gentleman in this room over here to my right, and him and his family went. He called me, I mean, literally, it's not, I, mean, I wouldn't even, I mean, I don't even know if I was done praying. And here's Jesse and his family heading up to the hospital to visit my dad. I remember the, the doctor, we couldn't get up there to get all of his stuff and belongings. And so a doctor who was on call the next day went and grabbed all of that stuff and said, I'll take it personally and make sure it's delivered to your room so you can have it. That way nobody has to drive all the way to Baptist. I mean, I'm sitting there, I'm like watching God move in so many small ways in, in a strong and, hard, and like hard moment for us. And I think if we went around the room right now, you and I could actually say this. We've seen God move in such a way that it helps us see and know who he is. We've had experiences like that. And so as we think of no other gospel, we think of no other God. The God of this universe, the God who is in control, the God who is on the throne, cares about you. Cares about you. And I want you to know this. You have such value. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And the God of the universe uniquely made you. Look around the room real quick. Just real quick. Just look around the room. Do you see anybody that looks just like you? Do you see somebody who actually probably thinks like you? Who has the same attributes as you? Who has the same qualities as you? You were engineered in the beautiful design of God uniquely and wonderfully. You are beautiful. And you need to hold on to that. And there's twofold of that. One, you need to see how much value you have. And you can see that in the cross. You can see that in the empty tomb as well. But it also, that also should change the way you live. 
Because you have value, you live different. Because you have value now in light of the gospel as well, you live different. And so I ultimately wrote this down. Who you devote to, give to, listen to, and serve is ultimately your God. When we asked that question a while ago, really the answer is who you devote to, give to, listen to, and serve is ultimately your God. And so who is that for you? The second one is this, no other glory. I want to ask you this, what is glorious to you? He says this, that everything else is accursed. So if, if that's true, then that makes the gospel glorious. The word glory is a heaviness or a weight. It's important, has great, has honor, has splendor. And often, here's what we view as glorious. We, we view as glorious as achievement. Uh, I don't, I'm not familiar with social media like you are, so when I say the word of, like, of following, you get what I'm saying. You want like a lot of following, you want people, I mean, that's the design of social media, essentially. Wealth, prestige, recognition, these things are what we ultimately deem as glorious. But if I can encourage you in something, it's this. Do not let the world or your flesh determine or define what is glorious. Do not let it. I think it would be so beautiful to one day look back and see that this room in five to ten years was living what the world might look like as mundane and just simple living, but yet seeing you guys living out your faith in different contexts across the globe for the kingdom of God. The four, you saw the picture with us four guys. Here's one thing that was really marked our youth years, and this is not a brag. This is a, like, I think this is crucial for you. Uh, we spent a lot of time with a lot of people. Uh, we, you saw us four together a lot, but we had friends such as uh, John's son, Seth. We had a friend, Aaron Cathy. We had Dustin's Zerk. We had so many people. But we also had a lot of, when I was in 12th grade, we spent a lot of time with middle school. Hung out a lot together. Spent a lot of time together. And you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. A lot of 12th graders are going to say, man, that's not that glorious. That's, that doesn't look that great. That doesn't look as cool. And a lot of times, sometimes, we, we, get, we get a little, like, we, we, we want to look cool. From the lens of Scripture, laying down your life, giving of your life for the cause of Christ is what is glorious. And guess what? You have a model of that for you already, which is Jesus himself. And so you just follow. You follow. Psalm 3, 3 says this, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. Maybe our desire every day should be this, the one who lifts our head, let's give him the glory. I want you to think about this for a second. You all what? You all probably rode in a car here, or at least a bike or some sort of transportation. Uh, you can see, or you can hear, you can touch, you can taste, you can smell, and all the different senses. And guess what? That is God's blessing upon your life right now. And so the one who does that for you, the one who holds it together, may it be his glory. May it be his glory. And just a quick encouragement for our leaders and for students is this. Timothy George says this. We do poor service to Christ and his church when we indiscriminately lead men and women to profess faith in Christ, but then leave them vulnerable to the ravenous wolves that seek their destruction. And if I can encourage you leaders with something, is this. Hey. Let us see, together with our students, this is for all of us, that God is glorious. We follow him and adore him. But as we lead others, may we be steadfast and endure with them. May we be steadfast and endure with them. Here's why it's important. is because one day you're going to be attacked for your faith. Because of your faith. You are going to be questioned. You're going to have people coming to you. I mean, it's going to happen, especially if you actually truly live for Christ. So in that, as somebody comes in to seek and to kill and destroy you, what is necessary is that truth and spirit be your God. But you have a community of people around you. And so leaders, and that is a phenomenal way to help help your students as you're navigating through this time with them in Word of Life. It's help be that encouragement, help be that spiritual guide for them. The third thing was this, no other good. 
So we've had no other God, no other glory, no other good. And we close that with that passage that, or the couple of verses that we talked about earlier, this approval and this pleasing. I believe that these two questions are vital to the direction of your life. I'm going to tell you, man, I have an awesome life. It's not, it's not great all the time. Circumstances happen. But I have an amazing life. I have a wonderful wife. I have a wonderful son. I have a wonderful job. I have a wonderful staff to be a part of. There are so many things I could, none of them, none of them can truly fulfill me. Not a single one. And so with that, what I like to use as a guide for thinking through of what is good and what should I spend my time on that is good is thinking of this. Does this matter for eternity? Does this matter for eternity? You read Romans 1.16, and you see that he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And then right before that, in verse 15, he talks about an eagerness to actually share the gospel. You know where that eagerness comes from? Because he knows that sharing the gospel is good. Is good. Why? Because the gospel is good. And so, from that, that means we ought to connect that and spend our lives for that which truly matters. You see, uh, one thing that marked uh, my youth years was uh, I was an avid baseball player. I played on travel teams, uh, won a lot of trophies. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you, it's pretty, like, I feel like God gifted me with baseball talent. And uh, my focus before coming to this church uh, was strictly baseball. I missed almost every Sunday of every, ch- of every uh, service at our old church. And uh, coming here... I remember Robert would spend a lot of time, uh, him and Aaron Caffey came by, uh, him and Seth Bowers came by, different ones. I mean, they tried to reach me, and eventually, I, they, I, for some reason, I, I don't know if I've ever told him, but I really didn't want to go, but I went to GoTel, uh, and uh, what happened there was that I was saved, and then later on, felt led to call to ministry, and as that season for me was happening, as that was unfolding, here's what happened. Baseball diminished. It diminished so much so that I gave up baseball my junior year to be here because I knew that this was important. And here's the thing. If you ask anybody, you can ask Jack. We play in a fantasy baseball league together. And Isaac Vaughn does in our fantasy baseball league as well. Like, I love baseball. I watched almost every game of this year for the Braves. But let me tell you this. You know, what I learned was that it, is, it does, has no significance for eternity. Zero. And if you invest your entire life and you, let's like weigh that tonight, spend a time weighing this, of all the things my life are made up by, and ask yourself this, do any of them matter for eternity? And if none of them do, this is a life check for us. Because he's, what's here is that there's no other gospel, there's no other good. And so all the things in this world, they might see temporarily good, but I'm going to tell you, the best baseball player with all the trophies in the world but has no saving relation, or has no relationship with Christ is one day going to die and go to hell. And those trophies are just going to sit and they're going to reside, but that soul, that person is going to be in hell. It's important for us to realize that. One day, you and I will die. And trust me, you sit in this chair and you think it will never happen to you. And yet I'm having friends that I know that have passed away more and more and more as I get older and older. Tragically speaking, we just had three students at a local or at a university in another state, University of Virginia, their lives tragically taken in a moment. You and I have no idea when that moment's going to come. But I can tell you this, it is important for us to be ready. It is important for us to be ready. So let me close up with this. I'm going to skip a lot, but uh, leaders, you, you have the application points. If you might just go over them with your students. But I, there's a quote by Francis of Assisi that I think is really important for us as we think about this passage. It is no use walking anywhere to preach unless our walking is our preaching. It is, a, it is no use walking anywhere to preach unless our walking is our preaching. And what this means is this. 
okay? If I'm going to go somewhere and preach, I better be living it. If I'm going to preach, my walk better be revealing what I'm preaching. If you read, I encourage you later on to read verses 11 through 24, which I know you've done in your quiet time, but I just encourage you again to spend a deep time in that because Paul is going to go on and tell you, hey, like, this is what happened to me. My former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church, I tried to destroy it. Hey, he had what the world looked like. He had prestige. He had that worldly glory. And yet what happened? I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous as I was for the traditions of my fathers. I mean, he lived it out. And he lived so perfectly as far as in its, in its own essence of what it looks like to live in this worldly prestige. And it says, but when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And then he goes and says, hey, I started preaching. I started going. His life was changed. And then if you remember, Ananias was the one who, like, God was telling him to go speak to him and reveal to him. And he's like, no, I'm not. I, do you know who that is? Like, he kills people who are like me. And he says, but go. And he goes. And you see what happens. And here's my question to you tonight. If you would get serious about your faith, what would it look like? What would it look like? Maybe you and I could look back and see that maybe this is a starting moment for us. Maybe you are advancing right now in what looks like worldly glory and prestige. And let me just encourage you with this. Man, let scripture be your guide on what is glorious and prestigious. Let it be your guide on what is good. And if you can answer that under the lens of scripture, which would say this, that it is one gospel, and that is through Christ and in him alone, of what he's done for you, how he's changed your life, how he has came and died and rose for you and the forgiveness of sins that are uh, over, uh, uh, through his shed blood. I mean, if you like know that and celebrate that, man, what could happen? And so if I can encourage you, let this be your guide. There is no other gospel. There is no other gospel. There is no other gospel. And so with that, uh, I'm going to let your leaders kind of dive into some of the things I had for application, but I need to let you out because uh, we're a little over. So I'm going to pray for us real quick. I hope this is helpful for you and I. This is, this is a, a passage that I feel like we probably didn't dive in uh, as deep as I would have wanted to, but I think the truths are there, and I think it's important that this continues to encourage you and to help you uh, in your walk and in your faith. So let me pray for you. And then uh, you'll head off to uh, your small groups. Lord, Father, thank you for these students that are before me, these leaders. God, just thank you for a church that supports their youth like Oakview does. And Lord, provides opportunities like this. Thankful for Robert and his ministry, Lord, and how he has shepherded this group. And Father, I pray, Lord, that we would all, week to week, seize these opportunities that you've given us, Lord, to hear of your word and to learn more about you and to grow in our faith. And so, God, I just, I pray, Lord, that tonight will be one of those nights where we have learned, Lord, and seen who you are, where we would taste and see that the Lord is good. And that we would be impacted by the fact that we know that there's no other gospel. Lord, for many of us in this room, you have saved us out of darkness into light. And so, Father, I pray that we would celebrate that before the people around us, Lord, by living lives that are pleasing and honoring to you. Not, not looking for approval of man, not pleasing man, but Lord, in service to you, that we would honor you and that we would be people that you would be pleased to dwell in. And if there's anybody in this room, Lord, or on the stream that, Lord, are, are wrestling in the faith, who have questions, Lord, I pray they would come to leaders, come to one of us. And Lord, I just pray that they would come to saving faith in you. Lord, I pray to be overwhelmed by the goodness of your gospel and truth. And so, Lord, may these small groups, Lord, be a time where we grow together, learn from one another, and, Lord, continue on, Lord, in seeing you, and, Lord, in uh, just our worship of you. In your name we pray. Amen. I appreciate Cameron sharing, especially on.